Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, what is the role of the charity sector in rooting out racism? And I'm in conversation with Kadra Abdinassia. Hi everyone, so I'm Kadra Abdinassia and I'm one of the organisers of the Charity So White campaign. Um, I also work in the charity sector on children and young people's mental health. And so the question today is, what is the role of the charity sector in rooting out racism, which I believe is basically, yeah, why charity so what exists. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the kind of key aim of the campaign is for the charity sector to take the lead in rooting out racism from within our society. Um, but the first step to, towards achieving that for us is really the sector recognising how within itself it perpetuates racism. Um, and then take some tangible steps towards beginning to root that out. Wow. So, okay, so many questions. What do we mean by rooting out racism for a start? What does that even mean? Yeah, okay. So um, just within the charity sector context, um, so the charity sector both indirectly and directly perpetuates racism, and that manifests in so many different ways. So throughout the course of the campaign, um, we're celebrating our one-year anniversary next month, um, we've heard of like lots of instances of people of colour themselves facing race, racial discrimination within the charity sector, but it also um, extends to the sector's work with its beneficiaries. So sometimes it might be, you know, continuing really harmful um, practices that actually don't really, um, you know, empower and equip communities of colour, for example. In, in other ways, we see that kind of white saviour complex narrative still being perpetuated by the campaigns that charity sector, charities, um, you know, put out there. Um, so these are the kind of different ways that racism within itself permeates the work of the sector. Um, so we really need to have open and honest conversations about how we can begin to deconstruct that and really centre communities of colour at the heart of the, the work we're trying to do in that sense. And have you been involved from the beginning? Um, yes, slightly. So um, I'm not one of the founding members, but I was the first kind of cohort to join the organising committee in September. Um, yeah. Wow. And what, I mean, yeah, what, what kind of inspired you to join? How did you get involved and what do you see your role as? Yeah. So if I give you maybe a bit of a background um, to the campaign, um, yeah. maybe that will help a little bit. So sure. the campaign um, was kind of initiated last August off the back of some really racist and harmful training material that Citizens Advice Bureau um, was rolling out nationally for all of its volunteers. Wow. Um, and, and it was all about, you know, working with um, black and minority ethnic communities and there was a slide within this material that um, looked at the key barriers faced when working with BAME communities. Um, and it had really horrible um, and unfounded racial stereotypes. Like they're often late, they don't trust authorities, high levels of illiteracy. And this is 2019 I'm talking about. Wow. <laughs> and, and that wasn't questioned. So, um, you know, one of the founding members had raised that internally several times and it kind of fell on deaf ears in some ways. Um, and so um, the campaign was launched in August off the back of that. And on, a, on the first day, it launched on Twitter. We had over 3,000 people engage, you know, sharing their experiences of why charity was so white. Um, so it's a, quite a controversial hashtag in itself. But, wow. Um, I, I, I saw that and I just, you know, I was like, I actually recognize and resonate with a lot of the things people are sharing. Mm. Um, and I just felt, you know, I really want to get involved because... I want people of colour to feel comfortable working in the sector, um, especially as a sector, because we focus on disadvantaged and marginalised communities in that sense. We should really be trying to reflect them as much as possible um, in our work. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of really inspired me to take part in it and it's been the rest of history. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So are they still using these materials? Um, no, they're not. Yeah. So they did um, launch an internal review into how that all came about. But I think, yeah, ultimately, you know, if you don't really embed kind of anti-racist um, approaches within your organisation, and if you don't have people from those communities reflected, yeah. these kind of things can kind of happen and go unchallenged in some ways. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to say that they are not continuing to use that material. Um, that's good. So that's good. 
Well, that's yeah, and that's it. And, I, and hopefully, it's kind of st- made them sort of stop and reflect. Out of interest, the person who kind of initially picked that up was that someone who was a person of color, or was it a white person? Yeah, yeah. So, as the committee, we are all people of color who work within the sector. So that's something that's really important to us because it's it's not that we're all experts in race and racism, yeah. but is that we're experts in our lived experience. So that's something that's a really important part of the campaign. And hearing you talk about it, it feels like it's a similar kind of vibe, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but to the kind of everyday sexism campaign. Is that right? It's like the everyday racism sort of yeah. the idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think um, the additional kind of lens also is that the charity sector often hides behind good intentions yeah. because we're seen as like the sector that is there to pick up the pieces and to advocate for those who are seldom heard. But actually, it's kind of ironic that these things still happen within that sector. Um, And you said that, so you all bring your lived experience as in your lived experience of just kind of life as a person of colour or lived experience of specifically, you know, kind of, yeah, experiencing racism directly? Yeah, a bit of both, I would say. Yeah, so again, it's just um, obviously now in current kind of circumstances with both COVID and the Black Lives Matter disproportionately impacting people of colour, we're starting to see that anyone who's a person of colour who works in the charity sector is being asked, you know, by higher up, hey, why don't you (laughs) help us on this statement or what can we do? Or, you know, can I speak to you about racism? And yeah, I mean, I probably couldn't tell you anybody in the committee who hasn't experienced some form of racial discrimination working in the sector and some of it again as I said it can be indirect um so you know being overlooked for a job promotion when you're equally qualified as your kind of white counterpart to really direct you know I've had I I couldn't tell you how many times I had people my hair's straightened a bit today but Mm -hmm. (laughs) when my hair's natural I couldn't tell you how many times I've had people just say bizarre things um and then again just seeing how we sometimes um how we work with our beneficiaries for me it's seeing that play out from a kind of research perspective or comms perspective in terms of how we talk about people of color so we might refer to them as hard to reach um so that it's kind of like putting the onus on them and it's like oh no actually we are services and charities are the ones that are hard to reach not these not you know not these communities um so yeah it for, for me personally it's played out in all sorts of different ways mm. yeah it's really it's it's interesting because obviously i i've worked with you in the past and was involved in recruiting you and uh we worked together at the children and young people's mental health coalition and i'm just kind of trying to reflect you know you have to look inward don't you and think well did you know does any has any of this ever sort of flavored or changed anything that i did and i think certainly thinking back on that recruitment process you did stand out in that you know it we were excited to be able to actually introduce a bit of diversity and i don't think we we had that but then it does make me stop and think well how does that feel for you right now if everybody is suddenly interested in what you have to say because of the color of your skin when maybe before you felt unheard how I mean well there's a there's a question in there somewhere Kedra go for it (laughs) yeah no absolutely I completely yeah I completely agree I think right now where I work there's always been that kind of focus on inequalities and addressing discrimination so I I don't feel unheard and I never felt unheard so again I got involved in Charity So White before COVID and Black Lives Matter. And so that was something we were talking about, you know, before it's fashionable in that sense. Yeah. Um, that's not the right word. But um, and so like we were always in some ways committed to trying to address these things. But I think in the sort of mental health charity world, we always feel and it's true that most people don't have good experiences within the mental health system. But actually, if we look deeper within that, you know, it's probably young black men, for example, who find it the hardest to kind of navigate the system and are, and that's why they're overrepresented in more acute or restrictive settings. And so I definitely think there's more we can kind of do around that. Um, And maybe it takes people like me who can kind of, you know, who has some insight into that experience to kind of raise these points. Um, But yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's a a marathon and not a sprint. and so we need to kind of all recognise that and not pay lip service to all this talk at the moment around racism, because it's something that's been with us for, for centuries. 
and you've you, at the Centre for Mental Health where you work actually um, there's been loads of work that you're doing as a charity around um, sort of health inequality and mental health inequality and, and the impact on BAME is that something that you kind of directly influenced that those things have been taken up or was that kind of happening bef before in any way or no yeah exactly that stuff was happening already um, so they launched last year a commission for equality in mental health and again as part of that having people with lived experience on the commission board um, leading that inquiry this year so I, I hadn't been involved in any of that stuff um, but I did recently write a blog because you know everyone's writing a blog these days <laughs> on, ra on racism um, and it was really interesting just you know digging back um, into our kind of research over the last few decades and there was a really comprehensive report we produced 20 years ago on African Caribbean people's experiences in the mental health system yeah. and it was just so striking for me to see that nothing really has changed in terms of wow. all the findings and recommendations you know wow. people not feeling heard people um you know stigma being an issue within some communities um people you know not trusting services or being kind of mistreated and without you know any dignity in the system um is something that we still hear so much mm -hmm. about um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, not really now is the time for the action and you don't need any more evidence around inequality from my perspective. Yeah. Um, so what needs to happen? How do we change it? Yeah, so in terms of the work we've been doing at Charity So White, for us, I think it is the starting point is having an open and candid conversation about racism yeah. um, and also acknowledging that it exists within our organisations. And it's not about um, pinpointing specific individuals okay. for us it's just recognizing um, charities and unfortunately especially older charities are kind of rooted in you know all sorts of historical issues around like racism colonialism yeah. and things like that and so and we haven't kind of um, changed in the way we've been working in that yeah. sense it's always doing something to vulnerable communities rather than really building capacity, empowering them, equipping them with the tools they need to, you know, thrive in their local communities. It's always been this, you know, perpetuation of us existing as a sector and that we need to be there. It's almost like, you know, altruism on steroids in some ways. And, you know, we should be working ourselves out of a job and we shouldn't, we shouldn't need to be here you know, picking up the pieces of government or just doing really piecemeal work with communities. Um, so we've been having lots of conversations with charity leaders around this. You know, some of them have been open and public with their kind of declarations around institutional racism. Um, and some have been, you know, have gone a step further and have made some really tangible commitments around, you know, transforming recruitment practices, for example, mm -hmm. thinking about how um, they get more lived experience voices shaping their strategies. Um, but I think there's not a one size fits all approach because every charity has its, you know, slightly different kind of yeah. issues and dynamics at play. Um, but yeah, I think the main thing is to kind of steer a little bit away from this conversation around diversity and inclusion because really it's about power and privilege and recognizing how that manifests as a starting point because you can have however many people of color working in an organization but if it's institutions and policies and practices are you know not don't have racial equality at the heart of it then we're not going to really make that much progress and those people will, will end, end up leaving eventually um, because of the impact of all these things wow and how do we enable that kind of power and privilege for everyone of every color um how yeah how do, what does that actually look like in practice if you is there any like good practice that you can kind of draw on or examples where it's working well yeah i think um one area i think one area we're really interested in again is thinking about senior leadership and um boards of trustees again um it's a little known fact, but board of boards of trustees is actually within their remit to like promote diversity within the organization that they are a guardian of. And that means it's kind of legally binding as part of their trusteeship role. But I think it's something like 99% of charity trustees are white. So again, it's thinking about what are the barriers for um, black minority ethnic and working class people's people becoming 
trust is. And we, we do know what those barriers are is because trust becoming a trustee means you don't really get paid to do that work. Mm-hmm. Um, so do we need to kind of reform the way some of that governance work happens? Um, and yeah, there's, there's lots of, you know, really fantastic anti-racist training out there. Um, I couldn't point to a specific one, but I think each organization probably needs to undertake an assessment of some sort internally and consult their kind of BAME members of staff in terms of what the needs and the gaps might be and then try and source something that works around that rather than just commissioning a blanket training package Um, because yeah it is really quite nuanced um, and you know there's a lot of focus now on unconscious bias training for example yeah which I think is it's useful and important in some ways but again you know what are you going to do from doing what are you going to do differently having done that training in your organization And do you have the power to shift things institutionally or not? Um, But yeah, just more broadly, I guess, in society, I think thinking about um, how we embed some of this work around racial literacy in education is really important. So we've done quite a lot of work around health and social care, um, Mm -hmm. education in schools, for example, and PSHE. And there's, you know, really great material that's emerging around talking to young people about racism and discrimination. And obviously that, um, the school that tried to end racism program, that's on Channel 4. I've I've, I've found that super fascinating to watch, um, which just goes to show, actually, we're not really setting our children and young people up um, to have those conversations when they need to, you know. Um, So I think starting early, as we say, with all sorts of other kind of things like sex education, et cetera, that I think will kind of lead to real incremental changes in our society over time. What does it look like getting it right? You know, if we decided that, yeah, we want all of our children to be a lot more kind of, you use the term racially literate, right? What what does that actually mean? I think um, what's been really interesting is like, you know, racism is always like the elephant in the room. Yeah. People just feel awkward talking about it. And it's just like, you know, even some, you know, having people describe me as black seems to be, oh, like I can't well, yeah. say the B, the B word, which is like, but I am black. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, if you were to describe me in a group of like other people and like, you know, which one's Kadra? Just, just say black is not an issue. But I think that we're, we live in a society where everyone's sort of walking on eggshells around um race i think we've made a lot more progress around lgbt plus issues for example and having those open and honest conversations um but i think definitely things that will help is like having open dialogue and conversations and i don't think you know unless you're saying something horribly offensive uh, there's not really a anything a wrong question to ask really about that as long as they're facilitated in a safe way um so that's why school can be a great place but also it's about representation so you know thinking about through the arts world and um media how can we better include um people of color in our programming and make normalize conversations around race and racism and difference just more generally um i think we've got a long way to go um that side of things how do you feel about all the stuff around sort of black lives matter so obviously this was an agenda that you were already really heavily involved with for months before um this kind of trigger point happened um and we have seen a huge interest suddenly in everybody feeling the need to talk about this to do something about this to take action like are you seeing this as a as a positive moment in time or do you think we're kind of drowning in noise a little bit just from this one campaign Yeah, I think, um, to be honest, I've felt really conflicted by it all, um, both personally and professionally, because it's just been really emotionally draining period. Um, And people people often describe um, COVID as the virus that is, you know, plaguing our society today, but racism is the pandemic. And it's something that's been with us and ignored and has been ignored for so long. And that's why, you know, it's no coincidence that it's... um, people of colour being disproportionately impacted by COVID because of yeah. racism. But yeah. also, you know, during this period, we've seen things like in London, one in eight young black men being stopped and searched in May alone, which is just like really shocking. Wow. Yeah, one in, one eight. in eight. Yeah. As in yeah. one in, literally one in eight. Young- Lit- yeah. One in eight young men. And um, 
So I just, I, I feel like we've not made any progress um, as a society. It's just been disheartening that we've had so many inquiries into, you know, racism across different sectors, like the police, education, um, health, mental health. Um, and there's just not been really, you know, and we always talk about race. A lot of people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's why, you know, LGBT, you know, kind of rights has, um, you know, accelerated in terms of like really tangible action. But race is something we've been talking about for much longer, but have made no progress because we're always talking about it. So I think it's just we're at this kind of pivotal moment now where I think we really do need to just take forward the recommendations from all those reviews rather than commissioning other reviews as you know being done by this government um <laughs> you know we already even free charity so why um so if I can talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing yeah um we uh produced a position paper end of March on the likely disproportionate impact of COVID on people of color before it was even a thing, yeah. right? Because we already knew all the kind of health inequalities people of color face. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the kind of groups that have underlying conditions that are more susceptible to COVID, that again is disproportionately, you know, Bangladeshi men or African women and all these other groups we were talking about here. Um, so like, it shouldn't have come as a shock that these are the people who would have both contracted and have passed from the virus disproportionately. Yeah. Um, we could have done things to really mitigate against that and really protect people and make sure they were informed about, you know, all the risks posed to them in their occupations and, yeah. and what have you. But I think we left that too late and, you know, just commissioned a review that told us everything that was already contained and summarized in the paper we did. So it didn't tell us anything new. Um, so that, that's disappointing. Um, yeah, it's just a lack of action, really, Pookie. <laughs> it's you said, like, I can hear the frustration in you. Like, it feels, ah. Oh. So, so you look to like LGBTQ+, plus, I don't know how many letters we need to put in there now, um, as a, a part where actually we've made more progress. So this is a conversation we've been having and action has happened and you feel like racism needs to follow a more similar trajectory. Or, am I understanding that right? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely not saying that everything's been like cracked around LGBT yeah. rights because of course it has not in any way. And, you know, we know that trans people, for example, have been, you know, facing all sorts of challenges recently. But I think... Um, just in terms of like uh, like the equalities agenda in general, I, I think like different groups um, with protected characteristics, progress has been at different levels. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we either take this really holistic equalities approach and try and progress alongside that, but just recognizing within that, you know, um, BAME people, for example, and people with disabilities, you know, we're still so behind in terms of, making any kind of um, real changes yeah. in our society. Um, yeah. And do you think change needs to come like from the top? Is this like a policy level kind of a thing? Or is this about the changes that we all need to make in just how we act and behave every day? Yeah, I think they need at, at all levels really, it needs okay. to be dismantled. So we talk about, um, uh, at Charity So Work, we talk about the four eyes of oppression if it's a useful lens to kind of describe, but it's thinking about um, internalized racism and how we address that interpersonal racism, which is things that, you know, we can all kind of deal with institutional racism. So that's government, uh, businesses, etc., And then ideological, which is just, again, something that really drives racism in other forms. Um, so it's, it's a useful kind of prism for us to think about action across those different levels. And do you think any of those are more important than the others or are they equally? I think, yeah, they're equally important. Some might be more challenging to kind of address, you know, for example, institutional, especially, for example, within the education system, because this is something we've been talking about in Britain for the last, I don't know, 50 years. There's probably been so many studies on, you know, educational disparities between working class boys and black boys, for example, and um, other groups. And, you know, yeah, we've just not made a huge amount of progress in that sense. What are the things you think that kind of 
everyone can do. Like loads of people will be listening to this and they'll be thinking, well, I can't, you know, I don't sit highly within an organization or I don't have political sway, but we all go about our day-to-day lives. Like what, what can each of us do that might begin to change this? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, so there's been, during this Black Lives Matter period, there's been so many lists being circulated in terms of educational resources. So I think, you know, I've been struck by so many people just being surprised at like how racism plagues our society. And they were just completely taken aback by the George Floyd incident. But for me, that was just another kind of incident that's been happening, you know, it's just, it, it's become so normalized. So I think, you know, we all have to really educate ourselves around these issues and um, thinking about, again, like how, what power and privilege we benefit from in society and maybe, um, you know, how we can be a really good supportive ally to people of color, for example. Um, so yeah, lots of really fantastic um, resources emerging around what that looks like. But I think um, everybody has a role to play, but it doesn't matter how small your role is. Um, you know, all, all, all these things lead to kind of bigger change. And how can we be a good ally? So, you know, as your kind of friend and colleague, what are the things that I can be doing to be an, an ally to you, for example? Like, I've probably not got that right. What do I need to change? Yeah, I think, you know, it's just uh, be checking in, being supportive, uh, you know, when this whole incident happened, recognising how that is traumatising for people of colour, for example, um, you know, not sharing really harmful content and say hey you know look at this thing because that that happened yeah. quite a lot I think I was personally overwhelmed by people sending me really you know we talk about social media and violence and stuff being circulated and how that affects our mental health but it really does mm. um, so just thinking and being mindful about what what might be shared um, listening I think is really really powerful um through our work again just trying to champion and challenge things where they exist so you know it doesn't have to just be me raising an issue about you know why why are young black men facing challenges in the mental health system i think it's for all of us to kind of flag and challenge um any kind of inequality in that sense that we see um yeah and do you have any advice in terms of us overcoming our awkwardness about this because you kind of touched on this before but it it is an issue and I feel it um you know when I talk to you do I call you black do I call you a person of color what do I say and actually sometimes being fearful of kind of saying the wrong thing and kind of maybe inadvertently causing harm in some way that way just stops the conversation and you know like if we were having a conversation about suicide then I could talk about that really confidently because I'm always looking to break down that stigma and other people worry about saying the wrong thing but I've, I've kind of gotten over that and I can do that. But this, I feel so uncomfortable and I don't want to get it wrong. But then the wrong thing is just to walk away, right? And go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think um, a part of this is actually acknowledging the fact that we all have to sit in some level of discomfort for some time mm-hmm. until those barriers break down. And that's just the nature of it. Again, you know, not wanting to draw too many comparisons with LGBT issues, but a lot of those kind of conversations earlier on, I'm sure there was a lot of discomfort around like what you say. Um, For me personally, in terms of terminology, as long as things are not offensive, I don't really feel that strongly because I don't think any of these words are perfect. But I think it's about being really specific if you're talking about a specific group of people. So for example, what we see with the government is that there is a lot of talk around diversity and people really hate the term black and minority ethnic, but actually they they might be just talking about Asian people, but they use the term BAME, like it's really representative of a broader group. And Mm. it's like, no, because there's nobody black involved in this. And actually it's black people being impacted the most by X, for example. So let's just use the term black when we know, for example, in maternity care, Black women are the ones who are five times more likely to die during childbirth, not being women. So is that true? Yeah. Black women are five times more likely to die during childbirth. Yeah, that's true. Why? 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 Again, all sorts of reasons, kind of um, discrimination being a factor, the biggest factor really around that. Um, So again, it doesn't help if you kind of broaden out the (laughs) the group in some ways because the experiences of people of color are really broad in that sense um but sorry what was your question again you have i was sorry i was just hung up on 
five times more likely to die during childbirth if you're a black. If you're I know, black, but black Puka, can you imagine? We've known this for like the past, you know, four years or something. And you know, Where did it's it only come take... from? How how do we, what, what's the? Yeah, I think there was like a big maternal maternal death inquiry that was undertaken. I think the report is called Embrace Report. Okay. I can, share, I can share a link to you. And, and has anything changed as a result of us knowing this? Not really, no. And I, I mean, it's really tragic, but there was a, a, a really recent um, death of a black woman who's a big social media influencer. And we don't really know the circumstances yet behind that, but it just brought the conversation back to life and thinking about what does it actually mean for black women during lockdown and their maternal care. She's eight because months pregnant. Were, was that the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was yeah a really awful kind of incident but you know if that was pre-covid what could it be like during this kind of lockdown period um but yeah we've yeah i've looked into this because i've just personally was interested all sorts of kind of challenges and there unfortunately still is a bit of ra- you know significant racism within medicine so there's still text textbooks out there that say that black people can tolerate more pain and so is that a reason why a black woman giving birth might not be administered painkillers, for example? Black, yeah. I've never heard. OK, well, sorry, yeah. Yeah, excuse my ignorance. So That's and I'm okay. a very inquisitive person. So wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. there are textbooks that say that black people can tolerate more pain. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And, and this that- stems from like slavery and all these other things where they were trying to justify their use of like black patients for health experiments and things like that. I'm yeah. assuming it's just crap, right? That's not true. It, of course it's crap. Of course it's crap. Okay. It's all kind of rooted in, yeah, weird, weird racist scientists from <laughs> back in the day. And, wow. it, and unfortunately it's still with us today. And uh, there's a really interesting campaign actually this week looking at um, different kind of skin conditions. You know, like when they show them in medical textbooks, they kind of yeah. use like white skin as like the default skin to kind of show different things. But actually on black people for example measles or something might look really different on yeah. their skin but doctors would overlook that because they wouldn't be able to spot it because the textbooks just show them on white skin so there's been this whole movement towards like actually any type of skin condition let's try and show it across a spectrum of skin tones so that you can see what it could look like i'm saying this because i had chicken pox in january <laughs> oh wow that definitely weren't red on my skin but yeah, I was able to identify them successfully. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, and, and I think that's, that's the thing that's interesting is how this seems to pervade into every little domain of life, actually, that, yeah, when you stop and you think about it, this is, it's, it's kind of everywhere, isn't it? And I guess in the kind of work that I do, I'm often talking to people about needing to be diverse and showing every kind of person in their resources and making sure that kids can see people like them and have role models like them. Um, but actually that's really hard. And whether that's because we're looking to represent um, disability or ethnicity or, or whatever it might be, it is very hard to find resources which are diverse and inclusive. Um, but I don't think I've ever really... Yeah, you've made me really stop and think about how much further that goes than the kind of I'm thinking about, you know, the displays in our schools or whatever, but actually yeah, yeah. it's like everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Another interesting fun fact that I looked into recently as well was that um so I went on a really interesting uh webinar course on racial trauma. Mm-hmm. Um and they actually as part of that flagged that, you know, the diagnostic statistical manual for mental mm-hmm. health. Um, so there's like 300 conditions, mental health conditions within that. Not one of them recognise racism as a stressor oh. for poor mental health. Yeah. So again, it's just rooted both in physical and mental health, you know, research and academia. So I think there's uh, definitely, you know, I would love to work with you and others around like, how can we begin to, you know, challenge this? Because of course, you know, racism affects your well-being and mental health. It does. It just does. It, you know, no matter what condition you have, it would in some ways, because if it doesn't affect your condition directly, it might affect your access to help. Um, Which is just sickening, actually, on every level. Um, yeah, just wrong. Absolutely wrong. What's racial trauma? So racial trauma is interesting. So it's kind of like um, 
there's emerging kind of literature around um, experiencing racism, both directly or indirectly, or experiencing like a single incident or cumulative forms of like racism um, is like almost akin to experiencing PTSD. Wow. Um, that it really, you know, people, you know, affects their sleep, it, you know, fuels kind of anxiety um, and people kind of replay racist kind of incidents in their mind. Um, but yeah, so, and, and also it's a factor within anxiety and depression for people. So that this is kind of now being described as experiencing racial trauma. This all sounds quite depressing. Like, you know, is there kind of cause for hope here or anything that you're kind of hanging on to or, cause this must be pretty hard to be dealing with this all the time and being faced with these pretty grim statistics and realities. Yeah, I think for for me is that, you know, again, shining a light that these things exist is the first starting point. Mm -hmm. Um, And then hopefully, you know, we can create and design services that recognize that. So again, it's like, you know, we already do have interventions around trauma informed approaches that will, again, support people who might experience racial trauma, but it's just recognizing that as like, an issue that some children and people face and then responding effectively to it. But I think that, again, language is a a big thing that's important because a lot of people who experience racial trauma might not necessarily recognize it as like a mental health thing for example because people might just be so used to experiencing racism it's like oh you know that's just life and I think um it's sad that we live in a world where you know children have to be told that they're different and that they might be treated differently because of the color of their skin and you know i would wish for us to like not have to do that that all our kind of services are equipped to respond and mitigate against any of those effects um and that we just completely dismantle and eradicate it um but we're just starting with the charity sector because you can't do (laughs) you can't do everything kind of everything um yeah but if we can get it right then maybe it's something we can replicate in other kind of settings why the charity sector particularly is it because racism is especially bad within the charity sector or did it feel more likely to change or um not that it's particularly bad but i think definitely you know we're kind of rooted in champion equality and advocating again like i said for people who aren't really heard and involved in decision making so i think we're prime to do that but actually you know and we've got people who are really talented and you know people don't go in for it go into the sector for money Mm. they tend to be really committed and passionate about making a change so yeah i think it's definitely a fertile kind of environment to addressing these things and ultimately for us it's like we don't want to burn down the charity sector by no means we just want to make it more effective and it's one of the ways to do that is just recognizing that you know we ourselves kind of perpetuate racism in some ways um but let's just take small steps um to kind of challenging ourselves and trying to reduce um that playing out in our work and are these messages and ideas being kind of universally well received within the sector or are you getting any pushback um yeah i would say they are universally being well received but again it's this idea that you know some people and organizations might be paying lip service to it so okay. putting out a really nice, you know, nicely worded anti-racist statement. But, you know, is that the reality within their organisations in terms of making things happen? Mm. So I think um, we need to also acknowledge that some of it will take funding as a sector. You know, it's not things that you can necessarily do for free. Okay. You know, like overhauling your recruitment approaches, for example. You're going to have to put a budget towards that. So, you know, let's uh, back up the commitments and to speak with action and funding. What would that money be spent on? So say, yeah, a a charity decided they were going to invest in overhauling their recruitment process to make it, um, well, to improve it. What what would they actually do? What would they spend that money on? I mean, I would say, for, for example, consultation work, right? A lot of the time, the charity sector expects um, to consult people with lived experience for free. And I personally, I'm so against that because you know you have to pay that that for me is a form of expertise just as much as a consultant offers you Mm -hmm. so you should pay equivalent to that or at least pay something towards that and so that's an area for example that you know you should kind of root your root the work and the investigations around some of the challenges you have in recruitment in people's lived experiences and pay them for that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah 
I think yeah, just not turning too much to like consultants for everything, but trying to value and support and pay the people within your organizations and um, within the communities you serve. So it's more about actually paying for that um, experience and giving and, and paying people fairly rather than that you would be spending the money sort of overhauling the, the procedure as such. Yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, we've been doing recruitment in the same way for such a long time. So they could be really creative and different ways to test people's competencies. I, for one, for example, don't feel everyone who works in the charity sector, you know, it's a really hard sector to get into. So when I was getting into the charity sector, I, um, I, was, work- I was doing an internship and I had two other jobs. <laughs> I was working part time in a school and I was tutoring. So I was almost like working six, seven days a week um, just to do an unpaid internship. So I think, again, it's really important for us to like, and unpaid volunteer roles and internships when they're really jobs. Yeah, um, so. I, yeah, I, I I hear you on that, and I think that regardless of the color of someone's skin, I think that's really important actually that people yeah. have different backgrounds because it'd be the same if you were, um, uh, you know, if you if you were coming from a background of poverty, and I've definitely interviewed in the past at that kind of level, that kind of internship entry role level, and felt that all the people who were presented to me were basically privileged, like yeah. whatever their color, they came from a background yeah. where they'd been supported to, you know get the experience they needed to enter the workplace yeah Um, you talked before just going backwards in the conversation a little bit um about um this idea of groups being hard to reach and actually it's not the the groups that are hard to reach it's the charity that's inaccessible to the groups talk to me a little bit about that and how do we change that yeah i think for me it's like for example um there might be an opportunity for the charity sector to facilitate a conversation with the department for education for example what we would do is like post these opportunities on twitter and on uh, you know in our email bulletins or something like that that you know and then if we don't get take up from underserved communities we say well they're hard to reach and it's like why would they follow you on twitter (laughs) you know and so i think um it's about us going to where these communities are and being really proactive so what are the spaces that they and and the mediums that they um engage with and trying to encourage their kind of engagement through those avenues rather than expecting them to like see our kind of call outs on our channels (laughs) which I just think is so ridiculous because if I was a teenager I would definitely not see any charity I would not be following them on Twitter no you know in any way so we yeah we need to be going to where they are again trying to have incentives again you know and covering expenses I think that's just such an underestimated kind of Mm -hmm. um issue so if people can't get to where you're holding your consultation for example if it's face to face in the future, how do you expect them to, you know, engage? Um, that might be a, a young person who's living in poverty and just doesn't have the means to make it to the session, but would absolutely have loads to contribute to, to the yeah. discussion. So it's trying to understand and navigate those barriers. So a couple of things to pick up on there. First of all, is there any good practice or ideas that you can share about you know you said we'll go to where they are where are they like where do where do we where do we go where do we place these ads where do we recruit for for people if we want to genuinely involve them yeah um so one of our kind of key asks recently of the government and the charity sector is really prioritizing BAME-led um community groups because actually people and communities are more likely to engage in services where people look like them yeah. So could we work more effectively as charities with the communities? Um, but we know, you know, they've been massively impacted by the pandemic financially. Um, so, you know, it's thinking about how we can best support them to, you know, engage with those groups. Um, yeah, that and answers is, your question. And is there anything that we need to do in terms of, so, okay, so imagine we've taken that step and we've managed to engage better with the communities we've gone to where we will find um, those who we wish to engage with. What then do we need to do in terms of reassuring that they will be genuinely seen and heard and that they're coming into a safe space where they can share their views? Because maybe I'm wrong, but I'm guessing that that could be a potential barrier as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, where possible, I, I really like it where when from the onset we can engage communities that we're trying to you know, study in the design of our research programs, because that's where you can really begin to deconstruct and 
um, understand what might be some of their hesitations and build that in from the beginning. So I think often what we do is that we kind of, as researchers or academics or policy people, we decide what the script is and what we're going to focus on. And then we're like, come and tell us about this. And actually the problem for them might be completely different. So we should, co-production should be kind of embedded from the onset. Yeah. Um, and then that could affect the way that we do engagement, for example. It might not be a focus group or an interview, but, you know, I think we can't under, underestimate the creativity and solutions that communities have. Yeah. And we really should be looking to them around how best to kind of engage them. Um, and then I think beyond that, often what happens is that we consult people, we get the research that we want and we, we just kind of drop them. And it's like, bye. You know, and so for people, they're emotionally, again, so invested in in this work and have contributed to it. What can we do to kind of keep them along in the journey? Um, It could be small things like, you know, inviting them to kind of present part of the research, you know, wherever we might be sharing it. Um, Having them involved in like the influencing work around it. Um, there might be a follow-up in the future I know all these things are like funding dependent but if we if we ask for it in the beginning and build it in there might be a chance that we could actually get funding for it yeah and I think that you're right it's it is important and actually if we can't do the work properly maybe we shouldn't be doing it because I think I don't know I feel quite strongly sometimes that we end up doing these things in a slightly half-hearted way and I think it can do more harm than good saying that this matters and then actually not really engaging not really hearing not really responding is I think poor yeah definitely I think especially for me in the mental health sphere that always happens with young people isn't it it's like hey why don't you come on tv and tell us about your experience of self-harm and then it's just like okay and then we just kind of (laughs) you know get rid of them after that which is really sad like I think it really needs a lot of thought and consideration around you know people's kind the impact these things can have on people um and yeah I think it's it's all about relationships as well you know um with you know good boundaries obviously in place but really building relationships with people so it's it's a trusting relationship and it's somebody and a group you can always go back to um, over time as well is really important so it sounds like you've got a vision of this kind of involvement that is it's it's not as it is at the moment where it is just a kind of you know quick we hear what you have to say and you're gone but rather that this is about working with people over time and maybe building their skills and their capacity to really be involved um and 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 kind of form part of that is that does that kind of fit with yeah you? No, absolutely and i think as part of that actually there are some really good Um, examples like Mac UK it's one charity based in North London where you know a lot of the young people they involve in their engagement work and in their services there's an opportunity and a pathway for them to like get employed by the organization so again that could be something that you never know you might inspire some of the groups that you're consulting to get into research or to get into something you know just by their kind of engagement in that process yes because they're actually just seeing different things that might be yeah might become open to them they weren't aware of before yeah absolutely it's interesting what you said before about um maybe trying to be a bit more imaginative about how we engage uh people as well it made me think about a project that i came across recently by a uh, youth group in islington and a bunch of black kids essentially created a rap about uh, stress and anxiety and like the trauma brain and a what they produced was just so much better than anything I've ever done and explained it better and it also it was just I mean it was really cool really accessible to kids of any color I think and would make kids want to learn about this thing that I'm not going to be able to teach them in such a meaningful way but I think I would hope also for the kids that were involved probably meant that yeah they did feel sort of heard and like they've made a bit of a difference there and they're seeing people respond really well to this resource um but i mean i don't know i i'm I'm due to talk to them actually just because i saw it and was like this is wicked i want to know more but i'm interested to know you know how would a project like that have come about someone's obviously had to really go out there and find them and encourage them and commission it properly like that will have had significant investment of resource of one type or another so how do we encourage that kind of thing assuming that you i mean i I think it's great i don't know if you agree with that kind of project but yeah yeah no absolutely that sounds brilliant and like yeah that that's the kind of engagement work that I love like it's just so authentic and accessible like you say research and you know all these conversations around mental health and social justice doesn't need to just sit within an academic kind of framework in that sense um so I think it is really kind of 
um, capturing evidence and examples such as that and trying to um, get, you know, statutory services to take a more kind of user-led approach in their work. They talk about user-led and person-centered quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and I think there's, there's space within that for this kind of work to fit in um, with, you know, really dedicated resourcing and commitment. Um, but yeah, I think resources are always really the challenge around this. But I think uh, definitely social media has shown us there's really cost-effective ways. I've seen so many inspiring TikToks um, during the <laughs> lockdown period of, you know, young people sharing like myths, like doing myth-busting work for TikTok, for example, on okay. COVID. And I was like, this is just amazing because this has just gone out to all the young people and they know that 5G towers don't cause COVID, <laughs> you yeah. know, <laughs> through, yeah. through that medium. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, again, when I say going to young people where they are, it even means online, thinking about the kind of spaces and the conversations and communities they're involved in and what are er things that are of interest to them, be it music, arts, you know, TikTok, and trying to really um, take an asset-based approach rather than a deficit-based approach and getting them to fit around our really rigid systems. I talk about us like we're really hor horrible people, but we're not. We're just, <laughs> you know, just being a lot more kind of connected with yeah. what's going on um, with groups. And do you think it's okay to have fun with it? Like, yeah. Because it's a really serious topic, but I, it, it strikes me that sometimes laughter is the thing that can connect. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think I've just had, personally for me, it's been, you know, just seeing, so a lot of people have been talking about this massive, like, awakening to racism, you know, and for, for so many of us, it's like, you know, we felt like we've been gaslit all this time because we talked about racism and stuff. And it's just like, just watching everyone kind of talk about all these things like, oh, wow, you have to kind of see a little bit of humour in that because it's yeah. just like really, like, eye roll. We always knew that people cross the road if they saw a black guy in a hoodie that's been known like why is that a surprise to you like now um and yeah I think also humor is something that is healing too so there's quite a lot of really fascinating black comedians for example who talk about racism and yeah it's, a, it's one of the ways that people try and cope through like comedy and through arts and things like that which is beautiful in its own way who would you recommend is there anyone that you'd recommend like you know because I, I i've seen all the lists of like you know read this book read that book and there's loads of worthy stuff there but like if i just want to laugh you know and and enjoy some kind of black humor literally and metaphorically like any anyone you'd recommend i'm actually looking at my bookshelf right now yeah. <laughs> um, maybe actually i really like this book so it's it's called My Sister, The Serial Killer. So I think actually a lot of the conversations around race is just talking about racism and trauma. But I think we need to like have a bit of a focus on like black joy and happiness and fun yeah. and humor as well as part of that. So this book is called My Sister, The Serial Killer. Okay. Um, Oying Can Breathway, which is, yeah, a really, really funny book I recommend. It doesn't like sound it? like it's going to be funny. It doesn't sound really fun. Funny. <laughs> no. Why do you it like it? Funny. Um, I just think it's just... Uh, I, I'm really into like crime and um, crime investigations and things like that. Um, and it's just a really funny take on, yeah. It sounds really dark, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's it like does a really, sound really of, dark. Country, yeah. Okay, it, it, it does sound dark, but if you read it, you'll get what I mean in terms okay. of the humour. I'm going to like take up that challenge. Thing. I'm going to read that book <laughs> and I'm going to feed back on a, how hilarious it is. Very short and easy to read. You could probably read it in a day. <laughs> I am literate, you know. <laughs> No, but I mean, no, I just mean it's so short. Like, I, I don't really read, like, widely, but it's, it's a <laughs> I just love the way that you had to go, it's short. I, I mean, I like, I like, I like, short. I, I can read, I can read. Um, I can see you from your bookshelf. <laughs> yeah, I read and then I put my books in colour order. It's, and you write them as well. I do amazing. sometimes write them, yeah, I do. <laughs> do you feel a lot of pressure right now? Be, you know, you're... You, it is this moment in time it feels really important everyone wants to talk to you about race like I have to say when I because I, I was thinking when I was setting up my podcast I, I'm reaching out to loads of different people of interest within my network about loads of different topics and I almost didn't ask you something around race because I was just I just wanted to talk to you I haven't talked to you for ages this yeah, is quite an elaborate yeah. excuse to have a conversation but I almost didn't ask you about race because I thought do you know what I bet everyone's talking to you about that all the time you must be sick of it but then I yeah, looked at the Twitter profile and it is like the most prominent thing. So I thought, well, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, um, 
I did like, you know, when the kind of George Floyd incident and stuff happened right away, there just seems like, actually there was a lot of like people reaching out to check in and stuff. But even that, I just felt a bit overwhelmed and I felt like, oh no, people are just going to think I'm rude because I'm taking ages to reply. But I just need a bit of like time to myself to like process things too. Um, and because I have family in, in Minneapolis actually who lived there too. So that was just like really like scary. Um but yeah, I think what I've come to kind of realise is that, um, you know, there's an opportunity to really like challenge and hold people and systems to account through this. Yeah. So it's like, okay, now you're talking about race and, you know, let's have a really serious and challenging conversation about it. And, you know, what are you going to do about it and take away from it? And there's also the power to like say no to things, requests. So I have said no to like some people as well, because yeah. it's just... Um, emotionally draining for me so I have to protect my mental health first um, and if you're going to do a you know have these conversations in like a really kind of meaningful way not like oh you know we don't really have anyone black on our website and we haven't talked to anyone black about this issue can we chat to you but like really have a sustainable approach around how you will increase kind of representation and stuff um, I think is really important because also like I'm not being funny you're great but you're not like all black people everywhere are you like no. <laughs> <laughs> can I speak for your people like no what's that about no. exactly yeah no 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 no. definitely not and I think it, yeah no no again um through like charity so white we set ourselves up some principles um our three h principles which is like around love honesty. alliteration you guys we do don't we <laughs> honest honesty humility and hope so again it's like oh. honesty just having and recognizing it humility and that we don't all have the answers to these things and hope that there's hope that things can change and like you know that. i've kind of taken that into my work as well around these issues that's a great that's great i think that's not just about race that's about everything isn't it honesty humility and hope and i think yeah definitely within the mental health sector i think that's really important and as we're thinking about things like uh the you know next stage of the pandemic and that kind of thing as kids are returning to school like i think yeah again honesty humility and hope i like it do you think any of those h's is harder than the other um hope probably because i feel like oh we should have been you know I mean, my parents would have thought, oh, yeah, there would have been so much more progress around race for my generation. It's like, nope, I'm talking about it now. And I just, I, if I ever had children in the future, I would have want them to be like leading and talking about these conversations because it just really shouldn't be a thing in our society. Um, but yeah, that's why it's so important for us to really address it from a structural and institutional level because that yeah. kind of seeps into all sorts of areas in our society um so yeah i would say hope is the most challenging probably sometimes that's hard and that's hard but it's kind of challenging to hear that that's the hardest one because it's the one that you'd hope that you would be able to really grab hold of we should talk more like outside of this about if there's anything that i can do to support what you're doing as a charity um and and kind of help with this agenda i've got a, a really good and really engaged audience who generally just care about people like regardless of you know what what might make us the same or different or whatever so we should think about that um what would you you know in terms of a, a kind of final thought what's the thought you'd like to leave people with what do you want to close with mm, i guess i think for me you know we always talk about like inequalities and stuff but i do really believe that if we get things and society and systems right where people who face the most inequalities can thrive we will get it right for the majority of people if we just really prioritize getting that right nobody will have any kind of sort of like you know you wouldn't see a disproportionate impact of covid on one specific group because people will have all had sort of access to health checks and stuff like that in a more kind of equitable way and um, so i would say yeah that that for me is that if we can all come behind that idea that there are really marginalized groups within our society that if we just you know really recognized and admitted that they face huge challenges um, and are overlooked within our society and we really take concerted action to get things right and better for them then i think we'll just have a really healthy and thriving society and communities and that would be my one wish mm -hmm.